when you have uh, patients coming in from the from the community, uh, do you do you feel like the, they usually have had the appropriate workup and appropriate biomarkers and appropriate testing? Uh, not very frequently, no. <laughs> I think that um, I, I see more of a shotgun approach there where once they have a neuroendocrine tumor, they um, start grabbing urine tests that they may have heard of and get a, an entire battery of every pancreatic neuroendocrine marker they, they've heard of. And uh, I tend to narrow that down very quickly based on the clinical picture. Let me take that one step further. If we, if we go to the, the way that patients are diagnosed and how they do get referred in, uh, are there any, any patterns that you see? Are there any symptoms that seem to be driving diagnosis? Are these most of your patients diagnosed incidentally? Any, any pattern that you can describe? Um, I, I studied that. I looked at, for example, with the patient, uh, about 115 of my abdominal carcinoid patients, we did an exhaustive search, getting all their records and going back. And um, we find very specific criteria for symptoms that we said we could really attribute to their, to their carcinoid tumor. And we said, well, how many of them were, were diagnosed you know, within three months of their initial presentation for symptoms that we thought were definitely due to their tumor. And it was only three and a half percent. And the other 96 and a half percent got a delay of diagnosis at average six and a half years, and in some cases went 20. And uh, obviously patients are given a different diagnosis, and those diagnoses range from irritable bowel syndrome, lactose intolerance, celiac sprue, to that the patient is just plain crazy. And it seemed like the more indolent the misdiagnosis was, like celiac sprue or lactose intolerance, the longer the delay was. If the patient was told they had something like acute appendicitis, well, obviously, if you didn't find appendicitis on the pathology, you were thinking something serious when you were making that diagnosis. So the, the pursuit went on, and there wasn't such a long delay of diagnosis. So I think we found like 35 different diagnoses that patients had been labeled with. Do, do you think that, the, that this delay uh, is related more to the fact that people in the community just aren't thinking about carcinoid or something intrinsic about the tumors that makes them harder to find than other I think it's both. Um, we have our, our little moniker that if you don't suspect it, you can't detect it, and that is certainly true. And on the other hand, when, the, when we just have a primary small bowel tumor, that's going to cause some cramps after eating. Um, sometimes what I do inside the abdomen is I'll, I'll give the little primary tumor a pinch, and about a minute later, you can actually see the loops of bowel flushing and writhing. And I think that's what people have been complaining about for the you know many years when they just had a primary tumor and they would eat food and it would, it would irritate the tumor. They would feel these internal discomforts, but no one can see this on the outside. So they complain about it, and that gets labeled as irritable bowel syndrome and lactose intolerance and food allergies and the like. Um, they don't get diarrhea and flushing until they have metastatic disease to the liver, typically. And a CAT scan, which would easily find the tumors, <coughs> is not the first, second, third, or fourth test we get for diarrhea. Women, I think, have a disadvantage in that the disease tends to peak in the 50s to 60s when they're going through menopause. So many of the women are told that this is menopausal syndrome. <coughs> or menopausal hot flashes. Um, so it, I think it's a combination of the natural characteristics of the disease that make it very difficult to diagnose <coughs> and a lack of general awareness of not thinking of it in the first five or six diagnoses.